Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast. We're spinning the jams and spill the tea, and today we have a very special episode for you. We have a, a bit of a, a topic episode that we've done in the past. We've been doing some newer type videos where we sort of focus and hone in on something specific in the world of music. Last time, Riley and I talked about our favorite guitar solos, fun little video, and today we're coming at you with another video, but this time we're not limiting ourselves to the world of guitar solos. This time we're talking about covers, covers of songs that we like and actually think are better than the original version of mm -hmm. the song that we covered. Each of us have three picks that we have selected for uh, your entertainment today. We are going to discuss them, why we think they're better, and then the remaining three people who did not choose this particular cover are going to vote on whether or not they think or they agree with the person and if they like the cover more than the original version. Yes. So there's so, stakes. There are always stakes. Love a good steak. Uh, medium, rear. And it's also like a good opportunity to think about and kind of just have a discussion about like what even makes a cover good in the first place. Does a cover have to be transformative in some way? Or can a cover be better than the original simply by copying the original but just doing it better? Uh, there's a lot of, I think, different interesting cases for like what a great cover is. And I think our choices do a pretty good job of covering kind of like heart, no, no pun intended, all ends of that spectrum in terms of what a great cover can be in terms of, you know, hewing closely to the original, but just doing it with a new sort of artistic personality of whoever's covering it versus changing the song entirely into this new thing. So let's go around and we'll alternate and, uh, put forth one of our suggestions jake why don't you go first with your first pick for covers that are better than the original this is a situation where just because i think that the cover is better or i enjoy one version of the song more than the other that's not to exactly discount the original version of the song doesn't necessarily mean i dislike it uh the original version by the cars is a very good song uh you will hear no slander from me however i think this is an interesting cover for a couple of reasons first of all the fact it starts off with a really weird trip hop drum break that just kind of continues and still sort of keeps like the intimate sort of acoustic guitar tone for this song and i think it's just suited to the material of the like thematic content of the song a little bit more especially uh also chino's vocals on here really add something to that you know that aforementioned sense of intimacy that i think makes this cover feel really really special and yeah i do like the original song but i would be lying if the slightly dated synths didn't kind of sand off the edge of the song a little bit for me and kind of take away from the effect just a little bit but i just really like this because it's a really unique combination of sounds it's something that you wouldn't even necessarily expect from deftones at this point in their career something so tender but like there's like piano accents in this the echo delay on the voice and i love love how big the guitar effect gets once it gets to like the really like core part of the song it's just really unique sounding and really beautiful and i've always been taken with it it's not particularly transformative but what it does do and i think the all it really needs to be on a jams and tea list like this is that it deftonesifies that song it's almost like the original song has so much of the same energy as we'd associate with like this kind of moody soulful sort of track that or style that we love from deftones the original is by far my favorite car song a band that i don't generally have a huge amount of fondness for but i do like broadly speaking i, I think that drive is one of the best sort of synth pop songs not synth pop but like synthy synth songs of the 80s like to me that song has a an immense nostalgia i remember hearing it when i was very very young and the best thing i can say about the deftones cover is that it stays true to that and makes it feel i guess more sensual and uh, even dare i say a little bit erotic in a way that uh rick Kasich, god love him could never really be <laughs> the big thing that it has over the original 
I think, is just that classic Deftones atmosphere. Feels like if Teenager off of White Pony was sort of transformed into a yeah. fully fledged song. And the, the lyrics become, I think, more intimate and deeply felt, uh, not only with the added atmosphere, but the way that Gino performs them. I'm gonna I'm gonna dissent from the majority and say I think the original's better, if only because I I guess and this is getting already into my personal philosophy and what I like in a cover. I really personally have a heavy preference towards stuff that's a little more transformative than this. And I I guess when I listen to Deftones' version of Drive, while I don't dislike either version they're both great sounding i guess i just don't hear as much of the band's personality like i hear more cars in the cover than i hear deftones i hear both just i wanted a little more out of the deftones uh performance in this song no i can get on board with that and i will say you're Maybe I didn't make this clear enough. You're certainly not descending from the majority because I agree. I prefer oh. the original as well. Um, I think I have a bit more fondness for the for the cover maybe than you do, but I the original is like I think this is very much a case of which one you heard, maybe not heard, but which one you kind of connected to first. And as I said, the original has been in my life since I was very very young, and again, still one of my favorite synth songs of the 80s. It's kind of got the same vibe as like the verses of Toto's Africa. <laughs> um, but like that, if they were the whole song and they were like even prettier uh, and it has some real like just warmth to it. And, and the Deftones version definitely has warmth to it as well, but it's a, it's a different kind. Again, it's more sort of sensual. It's more sort of erotic. Whereas the original is just like this, starry-eyed romantic song that uh will always be mean a lot to me for how you know it, it just embodies that romanticism of 80s pop music so well all righty let's move on to our second selection of 12 today which is august to present august what is your first pick my argument here is i guess that i think this has become a version of this song that was originally by Gloria Jones. And while I do like that version of the song a lot, I think it's kind of irrefutable that Soft Cell's more gothic, dark, new wavy take on Gloria Jones's original song has just become what is essentially the definitive version of that track for, I would say, most people at this point it's what gets played on the radio it is i i guess the version that people think of to the point where i didn't even know this was a cover until looking it up while doing the research for this video it's it's one it's a it's a very great example of a wait that's a cover sort of song because you're right yeah. when soft cell released it it, it, it was it Again, it, 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 while well, the original was not super obscure, it was also like... It, not... No, it was still a pretty popular song in its own right. In its yeah, own exactly. Time. But this really does exemplify, I think, what you were saying about like true the truly transformative nature of a, of a great cover sometimes, where the entire context of the music, which is it's originally kind of like a, a very sort of uh, gospel-esque sort of hymnal, sort of like stomping, bluesy track, uh, with a very sort of heavy a cappella uh, sort of sensibility to it. Whereas here, that it's completely sort of transmogrified into the context of the sort of seedy late 70s, early 80s sort of post-disco era that bands like Soft Cell were like situated in. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be hard to argue that the Soft Cell version isn't the definitive of the two. But I will say that I think the... Gloria Jones' version has this particular shift in tonality compared to the Soft Cell version purely for the fact that it it is sung by and is sung from the perspective of a woman um, and it lends a sort of less pulpy seediness to it, I think, where it feels like Soft Cell are sort of reveling in how illicit the, the, the activities of the song may be. Uh, and Gloria Jones's version is still 
while it's definitely a fun song, it sort of feels like it's betraying that fact with its lyrics. I feel like there's more of a contrast there than is emphasized in the soft cell version. So it's, it is it is hard to pick for me because I value them for quite different reasons. I largely agree with Morgan, though I have to say I think I do come out narrowly preferring the original version just because while, of course, I'm going to love some kind of new agey, gothy synth shit, when it comes down to it and I try to evaluate the two of them from just like a artistic or emotional perspective, I just get more out of the original. The, the cover is fantastic and it's incredibly iconic, but I think the thing is, is that it's almost like the, the transcendence of it becoming the definitive version of the song has almost robbed it of its impact in a sense it almost feels like crystallized as like a fixture of pop culture rather than an actual song whereas when i listen to the original version i get more of an emotional reaction from it there's a sort of vocal dexterity there that i think is also like really really palpable that i think definitely has an edge over the new version in terms of like raw performance uh it doesn't have that uh really charmingly dated synth sound, but it does have uh, something behind it that feels really, really tangible and even kind of powerful. One advantage the cover has for me, and this is more of a personal advantage, is that it kind of situates the song in a queer context as well, because Soft Cell and the album that that song is on, Nonstop Erotic Cabaret, is a super sort of hedonistic sort of like transgressive sort of vision of pop disco as a distinctly kind of queer thing and tainted love as a choice of a song to cover there and, and recontextualize in that context it has this kind of edge to it like then the notion of tainted love the notion of you know this sexual compromise uh, in the context of the 80s and in the context of the sort of underground queer scene like there's just this edge that the song has by being recontextualized not only musically but also like societally and uh, in terms of like gender dynamics and all those sorts of things as well so um it's it's fair to say that it's a pretty close call uh, depending on where your preferences lie all right but moving on to morgan's first pick which do you want to go with first morgan Denzel brings an energy to this that's much closer to live performances of this song than Rage Against the Machine's studio performance of it, which is like weirdly relatively restrained, I think, uh, especially when you see it performed live by them. This song in particular, I think, really lends itself to being as fiery and barely controlled as possible. And honestly, in truth, I also prefer the guitar work on this cover. It's more of an interpretation of a live version of this track. And Morello has more of a tendency to really lean into their performances when they play this song live. And that's what I really love to see. It's no surprise that when this cover was released, it kind of went viral a little bit. Like it, it sort of blew up. And I think it ended up introducing a lot of younger people to Rage Against the Machine in the first place. Uh, as well as it actually it had this kind of weird uh, sort of cultural bridging effect where it introduced a, a lot of new sort of Gen Z people to Rage Against the Machine and it introduced like you had like boomers and Gen X people being like huh, just rap music uh, <laughs> for the first <laughs> just this Denzel Curry guy he, he's got some you know some fire in his belly and so it kind of had this effect of bridging generations in a certain way that i'm sure curry wouldn't have intended he just probably covered a song because it's badass and rage and curry's own albums at least records like imperial and taboo at least like have a very sort of fiery energy to them and denzel as a performer like doesn't have to strain himself to evoke zach de la roca essentially because he's just got that same sort of energy and that's the best thing I can say about this cover is that he absolutely harnesses the same sort of power and energy that Zach De La Roca has. Honestly, I don't even think I can separate these two versions of the song. Like the, the cover is such a faithful rendition. And I probably agree that like 
this the overall sound of the cover is maybe more impressive just because it has a sort of more modern slickness to it and and the the drums especially have this real kind of intensity to the way they sound that i i absolutely love but then again the original has zach dow fucking roca and also i will say um this is personal taste thing i don't actually care for the interpolation of the sirens verse i kind of wish he hadn't done that but i can understand that why that would add to the song um for some people it just doesn't for me uh but yeah they're both really evenly matched i think i would just give the edge purely to rage it's um their song and again the version i'm more familiar with but it's a it, it absolutely rises to the standard that you would expect from a cover of this song denzel really just has something to his uh voice and delivery i think it goes down to the fact that he's been doing infusions of rap and metal in his music ever since like imperial mm -hmm. that make him specifically suited to cover songs exactly like this i think one neat little detail of the cover that kind of is emblematic of everything about it as a cover is like when denzel first comes in with that go in it now like the way he delivers that compared to Zach on the original was like, it's almost like close to black metal, the way that Denzel <laughs> says it. It's just this kind of really throaty, sort of scratchy scream. And right as soon as that comes in, as soon as you realize what Denzel's going to do with that delivery of come with it now, like that, you know, it completely the, changes the, the, the whole dynamic and you're already like, you're not thinking about Rage of the Mach Against the Machine anymore. You're you're now in it with Denzel and his band. And that's the best possible thing you could say for a cover, really, is it doesn't make you think about the original much while you're listening to it. All right, now it's my turn for my first pick. And I'm going to go with... Where the flowing old black and blue into a paper cup Across the Universe, one of the great late era Beatles songs on Let It Be, whether it is in the very sort of lush, Phil Spectorized original album version, or whether it's in the more sort of stripped down version on the Let It Be Naked album, which I actually prefer to the original. It's a great song. Fiona Apple, the way she sings the song, I absolutely love it, is that she has this sort of smoky way of delivering it where it feels like the entire song is this like lullaby that's being sung to you specifically. And I love that about it for starters. Whereas John Lennon is just kind of like generally emoting in that kind of soft, hazy voice he has. And it's fine, it's good, but I love the way that Fiona makes it feel more intimate. Uh, more sort of tender as well and also I love the orchestration and the, the the musicality of the cover so much more than what Phil Spector does on the original or even than just the stripped down version of the song I think that the John Bryan of it is like so inescapable and makes it feel so much more charming and and beautiful in a new way that it hasn't been before and again it's not to disparage the original i do think it's one of the best sort of late era beatles songs but like the thing is like when john lennon is doing that fucking deja, whatever it is that meditation thing all i can think about is john lennon is fucking doing a meditation ritual in front of me whereas when fiona sings it she's just put pouring honey in my ears essentially and i love that about the cover so much john lennon sounds bored on this original version i think it's a really good song i'm not and it and that sort of lackadaisical approach to the vocals on the song i think works generally but fiona sort of takes that floaty exploratory vocal nature that the song asks for and turns it into something really special and particular to her. If I can have uh, both a, a, a hot take and not stray from the pack, um, I like the Fiona Apple version more and I think the original version isn't really all that great. <laughs> Even though I'm definitely the biggest Beatles fan here, uh, and I am absolutely the person with the most love for Let It Be, uh, I, I don't care for Across the Universe all that much. I think it's the song that Phil Spector's production kind of drowns out the most. 
and re-listening to it, I, I can only kind of agree with uh, Morgan's point about the vocals sounding like just kind of impersonal, that there's something that's very weirdly distant about that song that makes it totally lose its luster for me. Whereas Fiona's is just like, it hits every single mark you want a song like this to hit and not to diminish the, the, the transformation happening here. But fact of the matter is most songs would be better if Fiona Apple sung them and John Bryan produced them. So yeah. you're right. They're both delivering the song in the same way. They're both going for this kind of like lullaby-esque sort of soft delivery. Right. But the thing is like Fiona Apple is just better at doing that, generally speaking. Yes. John yeah. Lennon is better when he's kind of like trying to make you feel emotionally threatened than when he's trying to comfort you. Like I, I always respond best to John Lennon when he's like, when you feel like the danger in the way that he sings or when there's just an edge to him. Like I don't, I don't prefer. Uh, uh, yeah. The danger of John Lennon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't so, want to be married to him, but you know. <laughs> Neither did Cynthia. Let's go back around again. And Jake, what is your second pick for a cover is better than the original? It is primarily not really a Pink Floyd song. It is a Sid Barrett song. Mm. Uh, This is from that particular era of the band when Pink Floyd were that kind of more Beatles derivative kind of irreverent band that focused a lot more on I guess just far less progressive and far more into psychedelic pop that lent into the sort of, you know, the weirdness of the genre. And basically the reason that I love this cover is that the Mars Volta take a very like lyrically and instrumentally unremarkable Pink Floyd deep cut and they just make it fucking batshit. They just make it a weird ass aggressive two minute long progressive post hardcore vaguely punkish song fucking cedric sounds like a fucking demon on this song he's like he's full on bedlam and goliath mode cedric just like his voice is like scraping at the top of uh his vocal range and he's delivering it like he's an actual like demon and like all of the instrumental choices on this are so fucking weird and it goes from being a song that you just really wouldn't think much of to something that almost blisteringly assaults you and that you can't forget once you hear it it's just such an oddity uh, of a track that i think is it just really makes me appreciate not only the power of the art of a cover but just what certain bands can do with specific sounds and transforming things that are fundamentally just kind of vanilla and then making them far more interesting far more entertaining just no beating around the bush whack shit and i'm all here for that kind of stuff the original version of this song it sounds i would say quite dated and thin compared to a lot of floyd's later material and i must Mm -hmm. confess i'm not crazy about the volta version either i don't think it comes together fully but what i will say and and it's weird for me to say that about the fucking mars volta of all bands but what i will say is i the volta version is hands down better because it's kind of a spectacle to witness to see them just pull this absolutely unremarkable song out of nothingness into just this bombastic blitz of two and a half minutes of your time. Mm. And I, I, I admire it a lot for that of just being so wonky, weird and wacky of an expansion to that original Floyd track. Yeah, I, I mean, no surprise here. I definitely prefer the cover. But one thing I will say is the person who is probably the most fond of like that early era of psychedelic Pink Floyd and Sid Barrett uh, there's definitely a reason why this song didn't make it onto a Pink Floyd album. It is definitely a song that is not, I think, fully formed, or at least like if they were to record it, I think a little bit later on with Barrett, then it might come out sounding a little bit more fulsome. Uh, I do think it's very much of a piece 
lyrically and sort of stylistically with the sort of stuff they were doing on Viper at the Gates of Dawn, you know, and, and just in that gen- early era in general, like it's got that very 60s psychedelic rock feel when, you know, you're talking, if the song is about food in some way, it's, it's actually about sex. Yeah, well, like a food metaphor for sex, then even better, right? Like if, if the food references in relation to sex or like the language of domestic British life and then, you know, something sort of subversive underneath that, it's all very, very Pink Floydy, but it, it's just not a song that musically is fully there and, and it would need a bit more work done to it to fit on a record like Piper at the Eights of Dawn. But Mars Volta just make it their own. They make it feel impactful and powerful and, and intense and it's absolutely worth hearing i think i'll be up front and say that i don't care for either <laughs> version if i'm perfectly honest and this version is you know it's it certainly is more impactful it is more much more memorable but i feel like with a cover of a song there has to be like something <laughs> there to begin with and the original is just such a nothing song that Volta definitely adds stuff to, but it's not transformative enough to really make much of an impact either way for me. Well, my second pick, I, I'm going to pick something from an era where covers were very much the standard. I'm going back to the 1960s. I followed you to Texas. The reason why I'm picking this version of the song and as what I'm naming as kind of my favorite version of this track is mainly for the production and personality of one Mr. Lee Hazelwood, who is a very interesting figure of 60s country, who I think we could go into in some other formal capacity but i wanted to address him here because of his really psychedelic and haunting and atmospheric tinge he brings to his his covers and i think this goes for everything on the album nancy and lee that happens to be a cover uh hazelwood kind of brings this really weird psychedelic naughty production to what would be classic country tunes that i think under the stewardship of certain performers can come off more as like cheesy show tunes but the really the chemistry between Hazelwood's really flat voice and and, uh, Sinatra's really expressive, exuberant voice, I think is another way this song notches up from a lot of its competition. And frankly, the recording and recent remaster of this album definitely do a, a good job to help elevate this. Like, this just sounds so crystal clear and it makes every production detail sound gorgeous. Uh, so that's why I'm going to put up a vote for this cover. I mean, the original is a Tom Jones song as well. And like Tom Jones is one of those singers who has been, who is so like, especially nowadays, so like omnipresent in like the AM radio, like so disconnected from what we even think of as the most relevant popular music of its era of the 60s like he's just not someone i can say i've ever really developed a a connection to although when i listen to the original and when i listen to tom jones in general like there is a kind of wistful you know gentle power to the way he sings it's just very kitschy in a way that i don't enjoy the cover however is i think an excellent update of the song and really makes it feel fuller and, and more kind of complete it has a Roy Orbison feel to it, actually, that I really like. Um, and, and that's just reminds me of, of, of reference points that I can connect to in terms of growing up and, and, and getting into sort of older music, I suppose. But yeah, the cover is so much more going for it than the original. And, and what you said about the chemistry or, or the contrast of those two voices is the, at the sort of beating heart of the whole thing. Making it a duet, I think, is such, like, elevates the song in so many ways. Fine example of a song that, in its original form, I think is a good song with a good performance, good lyrically, 
And then the cover, I just think, beats it in every possible way. Uh, I, I definitely think the production takes it a step up. The dynamism between performers takes it a step up. And frankly, there's definitely something to be said about the way I feel like Nancy's and Lee's voices just kind of interact with another and make this song feel like it's it's lyrical content is just sort of emphasized by that alchemy of these two performers that sort of sense of, of wistfulness and longing doesn't really ever show through I feel like on the original version it's it's more emotionally potent it's more instrumentally potent uh it's it's just I mean, best compliment I can give this is this, I was like, I had already added this to my library when August talked about it on the what we've been listening to segment where he brought it up. And now I'm like, damn, I think I'm probably going to actually listen to this tonight or something because this shit slaps. Yeah, I mean, I can't just, I mean, Tom, what the fuck is Tom Jones? Who is that? <laughs> it's a fake Who man. is this man? Can somebody please tell me who this man is? It's just like a fine like am radio song really improved by the presence of people who sound sexy tom jones may have the skeleton key to drenching the panties of grandmothers everywhere but like unless you're (laughs) in that demographic you are gonna find very little to connect to with tom jones whose whole style and kind of ostentatious delivery and and his just whole mannerism is just so like so far removed from anything that he he feels we associate with being tasteful you would see like performing on like reruns of like 60s tapings at the grand old opry or something like the he's like the josh groban of the 60s (laughs) his version of this song sounds like a mediocre cover of this which should be the original version you all know i try to have as much of an open mind as possible but maybe tom jones just sucks (laughs) yeah i mean (laughs) lee hazelwood not an attractive man traditionally anyway it was like nick cage and a mustache on the cover of this album lee hazelwood on this cover looks like yesified ringo star (laughs) (laughs) and it's worth saying like if you actually like pay attention to the song and read the lyric it's kind of a devastating little song like it's a song about Mm -hmm. this couple who i guess continually uprooting themselves moving around trying to find a reason to settle i suppose when and, and trying to like eventually learning that you have to kind of let go of some of the dreams you have that may not be realistic anymore but it's kind of a song about not letting go and Tom Jones doesn't really do a good job of conveying any of that emotion, whereas Nancy and Lee, I think, really imbue it with that feeling. So, yeah, it's a a slam dunk, in my opinion. Slam dunk. All right, Morgan, what is your next choice for this list? Heartless challenge, pick your path and I'll pray. I think the biggest thing this cover adds to the song which already had really quite a threatening aura is just like a tripling down on how unnerving it kind of is. It's like such an imposing version of the song that builds more and more as it goes. And, you know, it's a Julia Holter song. So naturally the way it unravels and just the way it comes to sound is like brain matter leaking out your ears a little bit yeah uh, this is this is by far the hardest pick for me in terms of which version i prefer uh of our video today i love 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 both versions of the song i mean the original yeah. is a classic the the closing track on rumors uh every song on rumors has well not every song but most songs on rumors have this energy of like you're listening to it and you're like Sh- should i leave like do you guys need <laughs> and that's one of the appeals of that record put your shit out i'll come back later (laughs) is like is the kinetic intensity of the emotion and 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 the ways in which the different performers on the record are kind of like you know butting heads and then synchronizing and kind of all the you know even the story that record's famous i don't need to recap any of it but what julia holter does 
is she strips away so much of that and yet still manages to make it feel haunting and discomforting in her own way like she's i listening to this cover again i was like julia holter has an otherworldly extraterrestrial power that i can't fathom and she's able to take any anything i think and make it her own and also make you feel like completely unsure of why you even like it exactly like what a, you just feel the sense of being taken over when you listen to a julia holter song and the way that she makes a fucking fleetwood mac rumors classic her own it's not to be sniffed at it's it's a, a beautiful and eerie and, and gorgeously unraveling cover of of a song that's essentially about unraveling as blasphemous as it may be i think that like riley this is a very difficult pick but i have to give it to julia namely because like if you listen to any of her music you know that fundamentally julia holter is kind of cracked like, yeah. uh, like fundamentally she's an insane woman and adding that quality to you know the immaculate presence of Stevie Nicks singing the song, which is literally just like four and a half minutes of Lindsey Buckingham getting his ass handed to him. And then Julia Holter comes in and sings it, and it's like a siren song for dying. You, you, it feels like she takes that animosity that's felt in the original and somehow makes it feel almost cosmic. You feel like you're walking to your death, like you're approaching the gallows pole when you walk up to this. And it's so stripped back and her voice is like there are some lines in here where it almost sounds kind of like she's mimicking stevie nicks like when she says shatter your illusions of love like there you can hear like a distinct twang in her voice it sounds like she's trying to mimic it but for the rest of her performance it feels really unsettling and the way it kind of rides the line between being very traditionally pretty sounding and having that kind of tone just makes you viscerally uncomfortable in a completely different way than the original. So maybe it's just because the original is so baked into my mind and I'm so used to it just because I've listened to rumors so much that this one feels almost like refreshing. But it, when it comes to the effect that the song has on me, I do give the edge to Julia ever so slightly. I personally liked the way that the Holter version of the song kind of ended. I, I kind of liked that final sweep upwards, a little more dramatic and a little more, I guess, resonating for me personally. So I would give the edge to the Holter version. I, well, actually, really probably one of the most transformative covers we're talking about today in a certain sense, because a lot of the musicality of the original is, is really has stripped away entirely. And, and it's just this new sort of eerie soundscape that Julia is essentially singing the words of the original song over. And she finds a way to take that rhythm that Stevie Nicks has in the original song and make it feel like chilling and like a chain gang prison chant, almost. Like it has this very very discomforting vibe to it all right well my second pick is going to be you know this is a tough one to talk about actually because this has always been one of my favorite covers ever since i first heard it but the original is by an artist who tragically passed away very recently so i want to give a fair tribute to both artists here uh, and my second pick is uh, Shoo Shoo's cover of Falling by Julie Cruz, uh, fam most famous for being the instrumental of the Twin Peaks theme, but it was Julie's song in her own right uh, originally, and it is probably one of the most widely heard, famous, and kind of just generally canonical pieces of, of gentle sort of ambient dreamy pop music that you could possibly imagine it's from her astonishing album uh, floating into the night which if you haven't heard absolutely put put that up on your list and it is julie's defining song like it is her song through and through and it's difficult not to get emotional listening to it now especially after she passed away my pick here again very much like with fleetwood mac and julia holter it's not a case of an artist really improving the song not at all it's a case of an artist taking a song doing something completely new with it 
and coming out with an expression that is powerful and emotional and, and kind of staggering all in its own ways and not in ways that reflect in any way on any qualities of the original just in the fact that it is shushu are a band like yola tingo for instance and a number of other bands i probably think of where they have absolutely mastered the art of making a transformative cover and and they've done that by essentially doing a fuckload of covers and and both of those bands that i mentioned have have covered dozens if not hundreds of songs and know the art of how to make a good transformative cover and, and this i think is the pinnacle of that for shushu it is along with their fantastic cover of um the cures 100 years which we talked about on their last album uh, they have so many great covers but this one really no matter how many times i hear it just kind of staggers me and sort of stops me in my steps it takes that sort of gentle plucked arrangement of the original and turns it into this kind of like heavily distorted blaring guitar motif and jamie stewart matches that blaring guitar sound with a vocal performance that is I would describe it as unearthly like he again the song is about falling in love like the song is about the intensity of emotion and boy oh boy does Jamie Stewart deliver intensity here of course he does that's what you would expect from him but it's like a kind of intensity I've never heard from him on any other shushu song it's, a, it's an entirely unique thread of, of of his performance style where he is just bellowing alternating between his typical kind of whispery sort of haunted vocal style and that this absolutely cavernous vocal sound this absolutely cavernous bellow of the title motif that is matched with the intensity of the guitars ratcheting up. There's this great sort of like ascending distorted guitar line that's added on some of the deliveries of the chorus that just makes you feel like you're fucking rocketing into space. It is the kind of feeling that you would typically associate more with a band like Godspeed You Black Emperor than Shushu. And it just, again, completely transforms a cover that is in its original form plaintive beautiful touching sad emotional uh comforting and turns it into this raw kind of howl of emotional intensity and and yeah it's something else man shushu's cover was actually the first version of this song i had ever heard before i even had seen twin peaks and I have to say, I, I'm definitely with you that while I, I do I do like the original song, I have to give it to Shushu here just because I love the weird intensity of it. I love the oddball percussion. And I, I just have a lot of fond memories of the Shushu cover, quite honestly, uh, because I, I remember listening to this like back in high school when this would have been pretty near to being released. So the Shushu one honestly wins for sentimental reasons from mm. me, just because it's it's a track I have so many fond memories of. I have memories of just like pounding that percussion beat into the metal railing that went up the stairs. It's It's just a lovely, catchy version of the song that I think adds their own dimension to it. Yeah, so, uh, the, the yeah. original kind of makes falling in love feel like this kind of beautifully tender thing, whereas the cover makes it feel like devastating. <laughs> it, it makes it feel like it's, it's going to cause your fucking skin to come off. Like yeah. it's, it's fucking, this is what the Cenobites listen to for fun. <laughs> if, if I had to put this as succinctly as possible, I feel like the Julie Cruz original is seasons one and two of Twin Peaks and the Shushu version is Twin Peaks The Return. I reach out to the original version a lot more emotionally uh, for a variety of reasons, but I was really taken aback with Shushu's interpretation of it just similarly on that album, I think I 
probably prefer Shushu's version of Laura Palmer's theme to the Battle of Menti version. Tough call. Honestly, this one was one of the ones that I struggled with the most, um, mainly because I have had both of them in my life for a pretty significant amount of time. Um, because I had listened to, this is the first Shushu album that I had listened to, and that was way long before I even met Riley. Um, hell, I own it on vinyl. Uh, and, you know, I've been watching Twin Peaks since around that same time. So, again, it seems that this is boiling down to being which one is the more, like, the, the sentimental reasons, I guess. And both of them confound me in, in different ways, emotionally and musically. I think that they're both really kind of going for something different, but I am equally impressed by their musical qualities and the sort of dreamy atmospherics on the Julie Cruz version and on the just immaculate composition of the Shushu version, the kind of post-rocky build that that has. But I, I, gun to my head, I have to give it to the original version here. It's just the one that resonates with me more, the one that makes me feel more. It's it's a little bit more uh, iconic feeling. And, and yeah, I know, I recognize the purpose of the Shushu project is to break away from that. But if I was, am I reaching to, to one of them to listen to uh, on a given day where I'm feeling that level of melancholy, the original is the one that I go for. All righty. Well, it's too old for that one then. Let's move back around again for our last go around. Jake, what is your third pick for covers that are better than the original? I was not exactly given a uh, shortage when it comes to covers of Metallica's Black album because of the Metallica Blacklist, a project put together last year that features more than a hundred different covers of different artists doing different genre takes off of uh, Metallica's classic Black Album. Now, the thing is about the Black Album, if you've seen our Metallica video on it, we're not the biggest fans of it. I think we generally like it and have fondness for a lot of it, but generally we all kind of have the same issues with it and aren't like, as attached to the songs that are on there quite as much as we are attached to the songs on albums that precede it. Uh, and this leads, I think, to this being an interesting project because it makes the malleability of these songs to be really cool. So you get interesting like picks like Kamasi Washington doing uh, an arrangement of My Friend of Misery uh, or Phoebe Bridgers doing Nothing Else Matters and turning it into a really soft piano ballad. But the pick that I went for here is, I think, the one that gets at, I think, ironically, my issues with the Black Album and uh, the songs the most, while just being the most entertaining in and of itself. And that's Jason Isbell with 400 Units cover of Sad But True, um, which, to be fair, is one of my preferred tracks off of the Black Album. The reason I end up preferring it, though, is twofold. Number one. One of our bigger issues with the Black Album is that James Hetfield at this point in his career kind of sounds like a parody of himself. And sometimes when he leans into his performances on this record, it sounds a bit goofy. And, you know, Metallica, they're not the band that you have to take the most seriously. But these songs are generally very tortured, very internal. Like, Sad But True is in and of itself a monologue that someone is having with, like, a different version of themselves, like their conscience, really. And uh, this sort of play-by-play -play of how you know this internal struggle is emphasized well in the original version it's a big sounding song it's very doomy but i personally think that jason is built 400 units very americana tinged version of this song just makes it all feel better jason has this swagger in his vocal performance that's just positively enrapturing the guitar work on here is so much fun this song has a barreling momentum that i think jason really makes his own that really like a lot of the covers that uh i like on this blacklist project kind of take the sort of moments of lyrical silliness and make them feel more in keeping with the song because of the performance. And that's what I think is key here, is that Jason's vocal performance makes 
everything in this song really come together in a way that I feel like it didn't in the original version. I, I particularly enjoy how transformative it is, like how radically it departs from the original, like how thoroughly it takes a metal, a popular metal staple and just completely immerses it in a bluesy country aesthetic. And while I don't know if Jason is has exactly the right like level to really fully give the vocals all they need to cover this song he still does a damn good job and i definitely think that it is a really entertaining cover and a cover that finds new ground in the original or manages to mine like new interesting material out of a song that is pretty two-dimensional to be honest it's, i mean the sad but true riff is pretty great but like it's definitely like a case of a song where they came up with a great riff and realized we can kind of just oh, beat this we, have to make. we can yeah. kind of just beat this into the ground and and that'll be fine I mean, that's the bigger my biggest issue with the black album basically is that let's come up with a cool riff and just beat it into the ground for six minutes while singing about you know my the monster under the bed or whatever it's yeah i wouldn't say i think this is better than the metallica version but I, I'm just so enamored with like the sheer ballsiness of what he's attempting to do with the song that I get joy out of it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this. There's maybe one Metallica cover by anyone ever that I think is, you know, good. I like the Rina Sawayama and Tristan Man pretty well. And the best thing that this could be is wildly different. And it is. And I respect and admire it. Oh, dear. And like, well, I, can, I might be building this up too much. It's partially, it's like the Jason Bateman, I don't know what I expected gif. But also, I expected more than this. Sad But True is so ridiculous and over the top that's like the whole appeal of it and i feel like this still even then takes it down a notch and that kind of robs it of a lot of the appeal of it august what is your final pick for our list today okay it's a, a band that no one but me listens to called flop which uh, their name is fitting of their career trajectory, but they are a early 90s pop punk band. And they did a cover on their album called Flop and the Fall of Mop Squeezer. The, uh, the song is Big Sky by the Kinks. And this cover takes a, a really kind of soft and gentle kink song and basically turns it into a, a wild, rambunctious pop punk track. And I think that the real kinetic energy the, that the group brings to this song is at least admirable. And, and let's make it clear that uh, Big Sky is one of the Kinks' more enduring tracks. It's been covered a number of times mm -hmm. by a number of artists. And I, I picked this version kind of just because it's obscure and I... I wanted to kind of highlight how transformative I think this cover feels. It, it, it keeps it the core philosophy, but shifts the the genre a fair bit. Mm. And I think uh, Rusty Willoughby's vocals here, that's his name, I had to look it up, are actually pretty good. I think he, he, he adds a bit to this song that I, I don't think Davies could quite capture. And I guess my other ulterior motive for picking this particular song is that uh davies himself as stated in our sharon van etten and uh arcade fire we episode is not particularly happy with his performance of this track so as someone who's recently kind of entered their kinks era uh big sky is a perfect song and i it's one of those songs Correct. that gets better it just gets better the more i hear it the first time i heard it like this is great and then more i hear it the better it gets and interestingly the more i hear covers of it the more i love it as well i think this is just like the guitar motif and melody of this song 
and the way it, it kind of intermingles with the vocal melody is just so fucking addictive to me. Like I, this is a song that I could get stuck in my head and I would never get annoyed or sick of it because it's just so, but the, both the guitar line and the, guys just say that bass guy too too. god i just fucking love it so much that the fucking court like it's and i guess that you're kind of getting at i think a bit of the heart of it is that it's a song where if you're trying it's really hard to fuck up yeah because it's so fundamentally amazing yeah and it's a song that uh yola tingo covered on their very first album they did a great cover as well and flops cover i think is really strong too like i i, I don't think anything is ever going to eclipse the original and i think ray davies sounds great on it he's just whack at reviewing himself i guess it's a stellar cover of a stellar song uh and it's quite interesting because like flop i think from what i could gather by looking up on them are kind of like a power pop band primarily like they kind of are sort of doing revivals i guess of 70s power pop but just with a more kind of 90s edge from where they were at that point and what's interesting about the original big sky is that it's kind of a proto power pop song really like before power pop was really a thing big sky it kind of has a lot of the attributes that i associate with bands like big star for instance except just kind of with more sort of distortion more psychedelic sort of tinges in the production just more going on in general and one of the good thing great things about listening to covers of this of the song is that because the original was so dense with orchestration listening to covers really lets you kind of pick out how great the melodies are and hear different aspects of the songs in different contexts and really appreciate how immaculate uh the composition of the original song is I probably would say that I prefer the Kinks version just because it feels more like it captures a particular time. I like the flop one a little better. Uh, It's fun. Uh, I love both versions of the song. Kinks are great. I think that version's great. I just kind of prefer the harder, rockier, bigger guitar version of the flop song. So It's a very smooth and slick (laughs) and, and gutsy cover and it does strip back that song to to its kind of essentials which is a great way to appreciate the kinks more and more all right uh morgan what is your final pick i've gone back and forth a lot over which version of this song that i prefer uh, this cover was both the first time I had ever heard Running Up That Hill, period, and the first placebo song. From moment one, I was hooked in both senses. And just for the record, like Running Up That Hill, the original and basically any cover of it that is like halfway decent is like one of the top 20 songs ever written if you ask me so like you know just which flavor of this do you like i find myself leaning towards placebo's sort of really trip hop influenced slowed down paired back version of this song that really sort of lets the lyrics breathe and in in general i just think it's a really starkly atmospheric version of the song that sort of continuously builds on itself especially when you get to the the come on baby come on darling part where it really sort of explodes that's like just as transcendent a moment in music as it is in the original version i think it's a testament to the power of placebo and the quality that they bring to that song that it is even remotely comparable or just not even like immediately you hear it and you're kind of struck by how like approach and and structurally opposed it is to the original so immediately your first instinct might even just be like what the fuck is this shit but like i do think that it is worthy of the the song that it is covering but that said i mean yeah it is a pretty good cover of Running Up That Hill by Katie Bush. I think that's basically all I need to say. 
Brian Melko is Brian Melkoing it up. And you know what? I am. I don't dislike Brian Malko's vocal style and what he does, and I actually have a lot of respect for the fact that he kind of leans into the sort of snarly kind of like almost sort of immature vocal style that he naturally has, regardless of how it makes him look or sound, or regardless of how it might limit the appeal of of what he's doing. I, I respect deeply the way that he delivers lyrics and the way that he kind of. I'm running up that hill and we can deal with God. I can't even do it. He just has his thing and he does it super well. And it's either going to be for you or it's going to be not for you. I, I, um, I, I just need to say for the record, I need a whole album of Riley covering placebo songs. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the best thing I've heard all day. Thank you. A very friend much. in needs, a friend indeed. A friend with <laughs> weed is better. Um, Anyway, I'm gonna put my my dick in hydrochloric acid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so it's a really good cover. I think it does do enough to I think separate itself from the original, but of course it's never going to compare. Let's move on to the final pick of the day, which is my pick. <laughs> The Rolling Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, is probably the single most iconic rock and roll song of all time. You hear it before you know what music is, you know the riff to the song. Sure, I probably, I must have heard that riff when I was a little kid, but when I was a little kid, I also heard Devo's cover of this song, which my dad had recorded on VHS on one of his many VHS tape music TV channel music video compilations that he would make. But I remember this cover specifically before i even knew what a cover was this was one of my favorite songs in general as a little kid like i just absolutely loved the sheer bizarro manic energy of devo and i listened to so much devo as a kid and this is the song that i've always had a really tremendous affection for and the fucking most based thing about it is that that satisfaction riff is so iconic right it is the most iconic guitar riff of all time and the devo cover doesn't even try to include it in any way <laughs> it's just like fuck that riff let's just do a complete transformation of it let's turn it into this jittery zolo post-punk sort of song and let's make it just absolutely fucking make you want to get up and dance like the original is this like super classic sort of hyper masculine like sexual tension like i the, no one's gonna fucking let me have what i want and the fucking commercialism is trying to fucking tell me what to do and the tv is talking to me and, and i can't fuck you know it's the, the original was all of this like hyper masculine stuff and it's delivered in a super super catchy and, and funny way and the devo cover just kind of deconstructs all of that basically and takes this masculine bravado feel of the original song and turns it into this kind of just nervous energy <laughs> where it's like you're having a, a fucking schizophrenic episode essentially and it's an absolutely nutso performance of this song like the part where he just like he just goes eh, maybe 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 for like 30 seconds straight makes me lose my mind still to this day uh there's a fantastic music video that's super late 70s super early 80s uh that i will always have ingrained in my memory and i just think honestly this cover fucking whips ass it just completely original is again classic rock and roll song the devo cover fucking steamrolls it in my opinion it is the platonic ideal of this kind of particularly irreverent brand of 70s post-punk it's everything i could want from that style of music and i'm glad we get to finish up on this as well because to me the devo cover of i can't get no satisfaction is the platonic ideal of what a cover should be take away the most recognizable iconic elements of the original just get rid of them completely and do your own thing and make it even better somehow and i don't know maybe you guys will disagree i mean the original is a great song but I just am so in the bag for this cover. It's it's was my fa one of my favorite songs when I was like fucking six years old, and it still makes me giddy to listen to to this day. So it's a fucking slam dunk for me. I think the original is fine, a fun little '60s rock song. It's no Kinks' Big Sky, I'll tell you that much. And perhaps 
relatedly, this Devo cover doesn't do a whole lot for me either. I find it interesting rhythmically, but I feel like it's a little thin production wise. And it makes the sort of nervous energy that they're bringing to it a bit difficult to really feel as strongly as I should. I, I like the idea of it and the arrangement, but I think it calls for a bit more impact. Well, like the original was like a football chant, right? Like it doesn't really make you feel any of the emotions of the frustration it's going for. Whereas this is like so like to its core, a song that has this sort of frustrated tension to it, this angular kind of, I'm not saying this to dispute any of what you're saying. I'm just like adding to why I think, you know, the original was so lacking in a lot of ways, even if it is a classic riff and all that sort of thing, it doesn't feel like it really communicates the feeling as well as it should. Whereas this, I think at the very least does. Um, but yeah, I can understand it being a, an acquired taste sort of thing. Uh, Jake, August, what do you guys think? I think this cover's okay. I kind of like the fun, bouncy energy of it. I'm definitely with Morgan in that I think it it lacks a bit of the blunt impact it should have, I feel. So I don't know. I'm not I'm not particularly inclined towards either song, really. I guess the riff on the Rolling Stones song just gets stuck in my head a little easier than anything in the Devo song does. So I, I'd go with it on that basis at least. But as I said with some earlier covers where even if I didn't necessarily prefer them to the originals, I do like just the, the ballsiness and the boldness of it. it like in that sense, it's, it's fun. Similarly uh, with Morgan, I do not really love the original Rolling Stone song. I just, it's fine, it's fun, pretty decent, far from my favorite Stone song, even though I'm not like the biggest Rolling Stones fan either. But, you know, good song. They got a lot of good songs. And that one's fine. I kind of hate this cover. <laughs> I, um... It, it, it does two of the worst things a cover can do. It bores the ever-loving shit out of me, and it annoys me. It, it's, I have to agree with, with August and Morgan. The thinness of the production is really partially why this does just kind of sticks in my craws, because I, I cannot imagine a universe in which... I could want to dance to this because it would make me look like an autistic weirdo. Um, I like the, the rhythm. You do that on your is, own, but whatever. It's so it's true. Oh! It's so slinky and almost a rhythmic that it, it, it just doesn't feel like a song that's meant to be danced to. And I don't have that problem with other Devo songs, even on that same album. And also it's just kind of like the singer's just like, I can't get no satisfaction. Bass lick, drum hit. It's like it's 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 so it's so boring. There's just nothing about the song that comes to life for me instrumentally, and like it, it's just vocally. It's like uh, sounds like Devo doing the. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no. That is, but it's, I mean, it kind of sounds like a kid at like a middle school talent show trying to cover the Rolling Stones, but he just has like three other guys and like one dude just learned how to play the bass and he's like, I can do this. And he's like, okay, you do that. And he's just like, fucking hit the drum. I don't care. And he's just like, and it's not for me. You know, I'm doubly glad that we ended on this now because it's just so funny to end uh, covers that are better than the original video on the note of someone absolutely hating the cover in question. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It, 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 it brings us nicely to a kind of uh, an unforeseeable ending that I, I really like. Okay, well, there we go. Those are our picks for covers that are better than the original, or are they? Let us know some of your favorite covers in the comments as well. Are there songs you think are better than the original that they're covering? What do you think of our picks? We want to hear from you in the comments below. So hit us up down there. 
Also, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Plus, if you want to go the extra mile and support us directly, become one of our besties, you can hit the join button. And for just $1 a month, support the channel directly, get your name featured in the title call of every video on this channel, plus get priority comment response, and you get cool emojis of our faces to use in the comments. And if you want to recommend us a record to listen to and discuss on the show, then your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, folks. Rock over London, rock on Chicago, copy Max. We take care of you so you can take care of your business. Let us know at home what you think are the best cup of fucking shit balls. No, stop it. Do it again. <laughs> Let us. Let us know. Going down. <laughs> Let us know at home what covers fucking no, that's not what I want to say. Ah. Let us know what songs you think fucking no, that doesn't work. <laughs> ah. Let us know some of your favorite cover songs. The moment there. is past. Fucking right shut right. up. <laughs> <laughs> what are you even trying to say? <laughs> I was saying it there that time. <laughs> Tell us some of your favorite comments and God damn it! Yeah, <laughs> see, it's not so easy, is it? Yeah, shut the <laughs> fuck up. Tell us some of your favorite covers in the comments or don't. I don't care. Just click on the video, like it, watch it, subscribe. One dollar supporter. End the video. <laughs>